thank you to everybody um, for, for organising today. Uh, thank you, Facilis. And thank you to everybody who is uh, making today happen and all the people behind the scenes. Um, secondly, I'm from the Republic of Ireland, and the last time I was at a conference like this, Ireland had just voted no. And um, I'm glad to be here this week. And thankfully, they voted yes. Um, this is a very brief presentation. Um, Translators can't understand me as well. <laughs> uh, is there anybody here from Northern Ireland in the room? Good. Two. Two. Apologies for speaking on your behalf, uh, being a southerner, um, but uh, it's the best we, it's the best they got. Like said. So we're going to just flick through this presentation. It's very brief historic context. What's 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 the problem we're talking about? And the problem is a disputed piece of territory. Um, even though we have a Good Friday Agreement. Um, You've got it in your, in your presentations there. A disputed piece of territory to six counties of Northern Ireland. There are two communities within Northern Ireland who have different political constitutional allegiances. One side of the community with London as part of the United Kingdom, and the other side uh, who wish for, United, wish for a United Ireland. We're not going to dwell on that because that is a, a five-year doctorate thesis that um, could be done on that. But the issue is, how have we managed the problem? And managing the problem over years and years has been done by way of antagonism and separation becoming the dominant experience of public life. People live parallel lives, separate lives. Um, the violence that you have all uh, will, have, will, will, will know of reinforced the division. And you'll see later on in the presentation how that happened. I mean, the, the violence literally moved people away from uh, their communities into other communities. And those communities then became barricaded off from each other. And with that became suspicion and fear that that seemed rational, that you, you were always suspicious and people were always fearful. Um, they defined where we live, who we trust and who we vote for. The division that exists and still exists within Belfast, literally it defines a number of issues. And the problem was agreed that the problem is them and us, the Catholics or the Protestants, the Unionists or the Nationalists, the Loyalists or the Republicans. And the them and us was born out in where people lived, in, ter in terms of friendships and marriage, employment, cultural and political <coughs> self-identity, interpretations of history, which is always an interesting one. Justice and grievance, culture and sport. You, what, 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 what came into existence was two communities who lived separate lives. Housing, schools, young people in Belfast. 95% of young people still go to single denominational schools. Only 5% of children in Belfast are educated in an integrated manner, i.e. Catholics and Protestants schooling together. <coughs> Catholics and Protestants National Unions play different sports. Uh, you're either you're either a rugby or a fan or a GAA fan or you're a you're you're a soccer fan and even within soccer you have the Catholic teams and the Protestant teams and, you, and when each play each other massive security operation to keep people from fighting and this is in 2009. Uh, just a next one as well. I mean, we're talking about the past here. Uh, just a wee quick question. When do you think those photographs were taken? 1976, 77, 78? Well, the answer 2005, after a disputed parade was banned from walking down the White Rock Road in Belfast. Five days of rioting came, uh, occurred, and the communities were at each other again. And there have been other positive developments, though, that have been going on. Like Belfast as a city has been developing very much economically, um, and there's a number of number of uh, buildings that have come on stream in the last 15 years since the ceasefires and the development of the peace process. Um, and if anyone's been to Belfast recently, there is certainly a vibrancy around the city um, that you may not have experienced if you were there 20 years ago. Um, and there's also uh, a young population 
that uh, there's a generation of people who didn't have to leave. Um, well, next one again, Victoria Centre. And, and there's also the new politics, and, uh, and I love this photograph because I think that photograph symbolises for me uh, a very symbolic coming together. It's, um, I know he was one of your members here for a while at the European Parliament and caused a bit of trouble 30 years ago when someone came from Rome to visit. Um, but um, a, a, lady, a lady highlighted, uh, I think, something very important in her and what she said about people who are willing to take risks to work together. And I think that is also a, an example of people who are willing to take risks to work together. And it wasn't only just the coming together in terms of a commitment to deliver on politics. It was also a, a coming together that gave people permission that it's okay to be with the other. And I think that's an important point to note. So I work, I work for Belfast City Council, and Belfast as a city is quite a small city. You can walk nearly anywhere you want to go in Belfast, it's a very small city. But within the city, uh, there were more than 1,500 people killed in security related incidents. And that's 48% of the total in Northern Ireland over the number, over the, 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 let's call it the troubles just for today. Um, and even within that 48%, within a sort of a two square mile radius in North Belfast, there would have been quite a high percentage of that as well. So you have places in parts of Belfast where lots and lots of families um, and communities were touched um, were hurt and were victimised. Um, and this is the way in terms of the challenges of um, city diplomacy and building better relations in the city. Just to highlight here, this is a map of Belfast. It's the green and orange map. Now this is based on the census in 2001. But 92.5% of all public housing in Belfast is segregated. That means it's either Catholic or Protestant public housing that is 92 and a half percent the very very dark green areas would be areas that would be about 100 percent as close to 100 percent Catholic as you can find so the, the very dark green areas there that's West Belfast and the very dark orange areas would be areas that would be about you know between 90 and 100 percent exclusively Protestant areas and that's East Belfast and within North Belfast you've got a patchwork quilt of areas that are the very dark green and the very dark orange that are sitting cheek and jowl with each other. And then what, uh, the, the, the sort of the light yellow bits are the, the leafy suburbs of South Belfast where uh, the middle class uh, people scarpered to over the years. And we define these areas in terms of territory and in terms of what we call peace lines. Now I'm going to give you an interesting statistic that, uh, you know, may you may find a bit shocking, but in, 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 when the Good Friday Agreement was signed in 1998, there were 38 peace walls in Belfast. There are 47 today, and the latest one was built on the grounds of an integrated school in North Belfast, in order to keep people from fighting. And territory again is marked out by artwork, murals and walls, and this is all about defining who we aren't keep out. In terms of the city, it's a changing city in terms of the investment um, since, since the EU expansion in 2004, quite a, a, a large uh, uh, migration into Belfast as a city. And even in the whole island, 10% of, of workers in the Republic of Ireland are, are, are from migrant countries, and quite a large proportion of them are actually from England, which is quite an interesting one. Um, in terms of what we're dealing with now, in terms of the work that we're doing now, is the what we call the legacies of, of the conflict. Poverty and violence, and it is no surprise that the most uh, deprived areas in Belfast are areas where the interface walls are. And ironically enough, new migrants, because the, poor, because the cheapest housing is in and around these areas, a lot of migrants, particularly Poles, um, who've come to Belfast, find themselves living in areas around interfaces. The issue around safety is still an issue. In terms of the City Council, territorialism and the subsequent duplication of services, the way we managed the divisions in the city over the years were by providing a duplication of services. So we have certain, certain areas where the bin men go to collect bins. The Protestants go there and the Catholics go there. 
We've got 22 leisure centres for a population where we only need about 10, because if they get one, we have to get one. And that's the way the services were delivered in Belfast, and the economic imperative for better relations between um, the people of the city. We have a huge wealth of resources, what we need to do is find a better way of using them. Um, poor image of the location for investment. I think one of the things for me which is the saddest is that, that two generations of young people just left when they could and never came back. So there's a whole entrepreneurial talent that was, that was lost. <coughs> Disruption of tourism, lack of shared sense of citizenship. Quite an interesting one in Belfast. If you ever ask anyone in Belfast where, uh, where you're from, uh, they won't tell you they're from Belfast. They'll tell you they're either from North Belfast or South Belfast or East Belfast or Welsh Belfast. And they're not actually telling you a geographical answer. They're actually telling you what religion they are. Where, <laughs> you know, that's the way we work. Um, continued occasional civil unrest, particularly around contentious times of the year such as the marching season, issues around cultural expression, those, those sort of issues, and then the contested decision making that we still have. Um, in terms of ourselves in the council, 51 members, no one has overall control. Um, the, 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 a very small political party called the Alliance Party have four councillors in Belfast, and they hold the balance of power. Um, the mandate in terms of where, where, we, where we, we feel this fits into the whole conversation around city diplomacy is, is the good relations framework. And maybe that mandate from the Northern Ireland Act of 1988, which was, which was a result of the Good Friday Agreement, Section 75.2 mandates all public bodies, including councils, all public bodies to the desirability of promoting good relations between per persons of different religious belief, political opinion and racial background. So that's our mandate from the law. Um, within the council, it's a, it, it was consistently identified as a top priority in public satisfaction surveys. People in the city saying, tackle sectarianism, tackle sectarianism. Um, so, so our strategy, our good relations strategy was developed in 2003. And then you may have heard of this shared future policy framework for Northern Ireland, which, is a, which was introduced by the British government before the evolution in 2005. Uh, and, and this has been more or less shelved because the two main political parties, Sinn Féin and the DUP, can't actually agree on a shared strategy for implementing a shared future. And people, people, <laughs> people are just going, well, same old, same old. Um, but then we, 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 move, we move on, we just keep going. We have our good relations plan, and we also, councils are now responsible directly for the implementation of priority 1.1 of the Peace Tree Programme. And we're very, we're very uh, happy about that because what it's doing is, I think, in a very practical way, is aligning the peace program with local good relations work on the ground that's centrally funded by government. So in terms of good relations as a, as a, as a mechanism for city diplomacy, for us, the good relations work and the good relations program helps promote Inter-community dialogue, social cohesion, conflict prevention, conflict resolution, some of the goals of city diplomacy. It's also an effective mechanism to promote dialogue, cooperation and coordination in local peace building. The program helps create a stable environment in which people can live together peacefully in a climate of democracy, progress and prosperity. And one of the things that I find interesting about that point was the picture of Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness. When that happened, it in a sense gave permission for people to work at a local level on the ground. And when that happens, they create an environment in which the politicians at the national level can actually feel the confidence to continue on that path of inter-engagement. It's also as well good relations, a corporate objective of and, and what we're, we need we need to transform that into a place in which culture can be celebrated. And culture is something that is not a cause for threat, but is something that is a cause for celebration. And then our unit then, and the staff that deliver the work with which uh, I, I'm on. The teams that we use are, are basically the four teams of transforming contested spaces. And you've seen in the map and you've seen in the photographs what, the, what those contested spaces are. Supporting local interface work. And a lot of that work, I have to say, is carried out by ex-combatants, people who were involved in the conflict. And our role is to support them at a local level. Addressing duplicated service delivery as well. 
communities can no longer demand, well, if they get one, we should have one. If they get a playground, we should have a playground. You've got two leisure centres maybe within 200 yards of each other. It's a joke. Securing shared city space. There are areas within Belfast that, ca that are shared. Um, and it's about securing those spaces and trying to create new spaces that people can feel are shared. <laughs> Building shared organisational space. Um, and that's about, you know, even, even within the, the building of City Hall, if anybody's ever been in it, it's very much a, a sort of a, a, a throwback to um, the Unionist, British and male uh, dominance of the city. And what we're trying to do is rebalance that to make it a, to make it a city hall, to make it a space that people, regardless of community background, including the minority ethnic communities in the city, can feel is theirs as well. It's their city hall as well. And what we're doing is we're not taking away stuff. We're actually adding to it, which means that the, the unionist uh, community in the city as well are also feeling that their heritage is part of that too. Um, and then developing shared cultural space. And this, for me, is the most important one. If you can enable people to celebrate their cultural heritage and identity in a positive community-focused, well-managed manner, I think that's, that's the nut that, when it's cracked, enables people to feel confident and secure in their identity, that there's no policy out there that's trying to erode or eradicate my identity or who I am. And that's an important thing, that people feel there's no hidden agenda behind the work that we're doing as a council in terms of promoting cultural heritage and identity and promoting that shared space. Unionists normally feel a bit, uh, what's the hidden agenda going on here? They're just trying to destroy our culture. And I think what's very important is ensuring and reassuring people that no, shared is good. You're, sec you're secure in a shared space. Your identity is secure in a shared space. Um, the next, the next, moving on to the next slide then. Just the process that we work in. Like, I mean, there's only four, four good relations officers in the city working on this program. Um, our job is, is to support people who are delivering on the ground. Um, and, that's, and the work that they're doing is around the spelling myths and stereotypes of the other. And when you've got a community that is highly segregated, like for, this, is, this is a key part of the work. Breaking down prejudices, promoting and encouraging dialogue, learning about others, developing friendships, allowing for an explanation of shared values, addressing issues of mutual interest or concern, healing painful memories, being an inspiration to others, and improving civic life. And this is where, this is where the, the, the money uh, <laughs> is important to support projects that are doing that. And, uh, and I have to say, like, I mean, we're, we're about to roll out half a million pounds um, of programmes for transforming contested space through these through. Um, so, are we on the up? We have a lot of vibrant projects. We have a lot of community networks established. We have people who are delivering city diplomacy, who are delivering good relations on the ground. There is willingness to, for people to address racism and sectarianism. Interfaces are on the agenda. Uh, the issue of how do we bring the interface walls down, that is on the agenda. People are having the conversations now. Um, cultural celebration, issues around bonfires. There are initiatives that are happening at a council level that are also <coughs> interagency, um, that are enabling people to celebrate their culture and heritage in a positive way. There's a re-imaging program going on. People are wanting the murals, the militaristic murals, taken down. They don't want young people walking by them every morning. They want people to walk by them with positive images as they're going to school. <laughs> Sporting initiatives, the GAA and the Irish Football Association are all doing a number of different initiatives, sharing training resources, sharing playing fields, this is a city council priority. This is one of the priorities of what we do as a council. We're also enabling more people to come in and visit the city. There's, 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 a, there's a, 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 an intercultural approach to how we work. Um, decommissioning has happened, stroke is happening. Um, and, and, and also as well, I mean, political leaders are involved in the whole United Against Hate pro processes that are happening. So, is it all over now? 1,500 sectarian incidents per year, it's about five a day. There's 88 peace walls in Belfast in total. And that's, that's, sorry, that's barriers. 47 peace walls, there's about 88 barriers that separate communities from each other. About 65,000 people take additional journeys every day. And this is mostly school children. We'll go this way 
rather than the direct route because they're going through an area where the host might be attacked. That's a, these, these are sort of facts of everyday life. The duplication of provision is draining resources. We're only tapping into one tenth of our tourist potential as a city. Deprivation, division and regeneration still exist and in some cases I suppose are being embedded. Um, and, and community safety <laughs> tends to be about keeping dangerous people out. Uh, so it's good. Let's not talk about it. I mean, I don't know whether you've seen or not in the news as well. There were two soldiers and a police officer murdered this year um, by so-called dissidents. There's a whole load of areas there where there has been inter-community tension and violence over within the last year. And I'm going to finish with the last slide, challenges ahead. We're, we need a common set of values for community and intercultural work and distinctive policy, policies to address both. And we need, we need our government to lead, we need our devolved government to lead. We need to find a way to overcome a tendency to avoid dealing with sectarianism. <coughs> tendency to downplay both the local and global significance of intercultural work. Peace must be more than the absence of violence. The structural division and the tendency of cultural apartheid that exists requires systemic attention. Um, just that, like, I mean, reconciliation is not an event, it's a process. And I suppose there's, there's a saying that, that some people have, have called out, that, you know, in war you need a weak enemy, in peace you need a strong partner. What our communities have to understand and have to do is that in order for me to be a better community, I need you to be a strong partner in that. Um, and I'm going to finish on that point. Sorry for taking up too much time.